Welcome to the Enlightenment Evolution Hour. I am your host, Rob Gauthier, the ET Whisperer. The Enlightenment Evolution Hour is a part of the Enlightenment Evolution Network. Any ideas expressed by myself, a guest, or callers may not necessarily reflect the opinions of the network. Enlightenment defined the state of giving or receiving greater knowledge and understanding about a subject or situation. Evolution defined the gradual development of something, especially from a simple to a more complex form. What is enlightenment evolution? The state of giving and receiving greater knowledge as we develop from a simple to a more complex person living on the earth for our soul's experience. Welcome and join me for our Enlightenment Evolution time together. Hey, hey everybody, this is Rob Goth here, the host of the Enlightenment Evolution Hour on the Enlightenment Evolution Network, as you guys know. We are here today with a very, very, very special guest and dear friend of mine, William Stoll. And before we bring him in, I want to say hello to everybody out there who's listening right now and anyone who's listening back at a later time. Hello, guys. Thank you guys for being a part of this. And I wanted to uh, to make a few announcements. First of all, uh, the Enlightenment Evolution Hour is brought to you by the ET Whisper Patreon members. These are the people who help free up the time for me to be able to do this. So a big shout out to all of my Patreon people uh, who helped make this possible. And I also want to make an announcement that on the 25th of next month, we will have another very special guest, Daryl Anka. And he'll be coming on chatting about his experiences, about his channeling, about his life, and about a lot of great things that are going on personally for him. Uh, which will be amazing. As you guys are aware, the reason I do this show is to have good conversations with people. In my own channeling, I don't have the opportunity to be a part of that conversation. So very selfishly, I want to be involved with everybody who's uh, experiencing this earth experience in a very real and visceral way. And before I brought back the show... I would say that 99% of every episode was about channeling, channelers, metaphysics, and everything in that light. And all of it was about metaphysics to some degree. But this episode and this show after the reboot is going to have more conversations about all different sorts of subjects, including life, including what we're doing here while we're here on Earth, what our experience, desire is, what we want to get done with our life, what we want to see in the collective, and just a, a lot more real topics that are very, very deep and very visceral to all of us as we experience here being on Earth. And it really is important to me to be a part of that conversation too. And I want to say hello to everybody who, who's uh, here today, thanking you guys for being a part of this. And I see you, Kalina, too, on the comment. Hello, sweetheart. Love you. Uh, all right, guys. So today we have a very, very special guest. This is a reverse role situation for us. Normally, when those of you who are at our Patreon are experiencing me and our guest, William, together, usually William's on the other side of this. William helps us with our Patreon and creates a beautiful atmosphere for our patrons to be a part of and he is the dj he's the one who runs the whole live stream well all i have to do is come in and chat and channel and he makes it very very easy for me who is william some of you guys don't know some of you guys are not a part of our patreon and maybe you've heard him once or twice in the videos that we've released that we've done through patreon or not uh, first of all, he's a friend, and I met him through the channeling work that I do, uh, and once I got to know him, we clicked instantly, and we could tell that there was a lot more behind our connection than just this life, um, at least from my perspective, and I'm sure he would agree to some degree, but 
who is William on the greater side? William has been in broadcasting for many years. Uh, William is an amazing human being, a metaphysical connoisseur, uh, a human rights activist, and much, much more. I, a businessman, uh, this man literally wears thousands of hats. And I don't think it does justice for me to bring him in after doing a, a, a long, uh, maybe a written out bio or something like that. Because I could not tell you who William was fully if we spent the whole hour, hour and a half here just talking. Now, I want to make uh, you guys aware, too. I'm going to bring him in in just a minute. But before I do, this is going to be a call-in show. We're not going to take calls for the first hour. After the hour of me and William chatting is over, then we'll start taking callers. The link to call in is right in on all the descriptions of the videos. You can click that link and be brought into our studio. If you're here in our studio, please make sure that you keep your camera off. And please make sure that when you're not speaking that you're muting the microphone and that you're not listening to the live stream in the background so that it bleeds through. Uh, and then join us and we'll call you on and pull you in when it's your time to ask William a question. Um, and there's a lot of questions you'll be able to ask him after getting to know him a little bit more. So first of all, I'm going to bring in William right now. Uh, William, hello, brother. How are you? Thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate you being a part of this um, role reversal <laughs> experiment that we've got here. How's it going, brother? Uh, fantastic. You know, uh, fantastic. And hello to everybody out there who I'm meeting for the first time. I am Rob's very dear friend. And, and more than that, friends with Rob and his family and uh, the extended ET Whisperer community family as well. But it is kind of rare that I get to be doing something like this. Um, I am first and foremost a public speaker. I have no problem being a public speaker. It's something I really enjoy to do doing. But when Rob asked the question, who is William? You know, it kind of had this Zen moment, like, wow, how am I going to answer that one? That's probably the toughest question I've ever been asked on any interview I've ever done is who is William? You know, and I think that's why all of us are kind of attracted to this level of work that you do, Rob, is because each of us are trying to figure out who we are. At least in my opinion, if you're on the right path, that's what you should be doing is trying to figure out who you yourself are. That's and that the question will... of all questions, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, no, I, I am probably the last person that can answer the who is William question. Uh, I can tell you events of my life, things I've participated in, co-creations I've been a part of. But as far as who I am, you know, I hate to be so cryptic about it, but, you know, what are any of us to say when we're asked that question? Well, it's a tough question. It's, it's one that I myself probably couldn't put on. We're all multifaceted, multilayered creatures uh, going through the earth experience as it is. Start us off from the beginning. When, when you were a child growing up, what got you into broadcasting? What was your first broadcasting gig? And, and kind of give us a, a history all the way up to your YouTube channel. Oh, God. Well, you know, these things are kind of interwoven in your... I think if anybody's honest with themselves, you know, if you look at what you're doing now and you look back at your life, you can see that it's kind of interwoven into who you were as a child anyway. I remember my grandfather, this had to have been... I don't know, you're talking 1985 now or something like that. When I first discovered that any person in their living room could record themselves onto an audio cassette tape, I just hit the ceiling. I thought that that was practically magic at the time. You know, because my grandfather, he had a cassette tape and he played it and he, was, he had a really good voice. He could have been an opera singer. Uh, he never was as far as I know. But I'm listening to it and they're like, oh yeah, that's grandpa. And of course, I'm a young child at the time. And to me, this is absolutely, it's practically magic that you could hear your grandfather coming through your own radio in your home. This probably sounds silly if there's anybody young in the audience, but I think the older people understand what I'm talking about. And then when he showed me that I myself could do it, then I was off to the races. You know, then I was off to the races. Um, I, we, this, As I said, this was like 1985 or so, so everything's still in cassette tape. My aunt and my mother were involved in this multi-level marketing thing new skin. I don't know if anybody remembers that. And so as a result of them being involved in this multi-level marketing business, they had like seven or 8,000 blank cassette tapes delivered to the house so that they could, you know, for the, so I used to just snag them constantly. And so I had a never ending supply of blank uh, audio cassette tapes that I would record on. I loved recording stuff off the radio. Um, a little bit later, I started getting into VCR tapes once I learned how to record onto VCRs. 
Uh, I didn't have my own video camera until like 10 years later, though. It wasn't until 1995 that I ended up getting my own video camera. Well, I think, too, telling us where you were in the world at that time is very important for the feeling of those of us who, who did come up in the 80s and who did remember life before the Internet. Um, where were you located when you were exploring all these things? I was growing up in Long Island, New York. Um, the thing, and as you know, Rob, the thing about being semi, a semi-famous personality or well-known personality is that you end up telling your origin story like 90 million times. But briefly, I grew up in um, North Amityville, New York, and Long Island in the 1980s and 90s uh, before moving down to Virginia. So this was all going down in New York. And it, to me, media was just kind of a magic. I didn't have any any idea that I was going to do anything involving broadcasting. It was just kind of a curiosity. It was a hobby. And I still have so many VHS tapes that I recorded directly from television in the 1980s and 90s that are just pure gold. Anybody who explores the internet a little knows there's been a resurgence in that, like people just putting up old commercials, remixing them with music. There's a guy that's got like, I don't know, like 10,000 hours of weather channel footage on the internet that he mixes with music and everything. So, but none of That's this interesting. I never knew that. Oh yeah, there's a whole group of Weather Channel fanatics out there that why you remember the old Weather Channel with just the blue screen and the elevator music? Oh yeah, that was really big stuff. Yeah, well, there's a whole subculture of people that are still listening to it. And so you could tune in on the internet now and watch what the weather was in Kalamazoo back in 1993 uh on any given, you know, any given day of the week. <laughs> that is amazing. I love that. <laughs> So um, in line with my broadcasting, the other thing that was going on in my life at the time is that I was being abducted by gray aliens at night. And of course, nobody believed me. <laughs> this got visits to the school psychologist. I had a Catholic priest came to, to bless the house and everything, as was customary in the 1980s in a very Italian Catholic area. Um, you know, so New that York, was, that area specifically around Amityville, um, th this is a place that's well known in the collective, mostly, uh, I mean, Long Island, it's iconic itself. It's one of the parts of the boroughs in, in the city, but also Amityville being the place where they shot the, uh, the horror movie. Um, I can't remember the full name, something in Amityville, horror in Amityville. The Amityville Horror. Yeah, that's it. So you you were in that neighborhood. So people can visualize if they've ever seen that movie it, around the time, actually, that you were living there and, and what it was like. Right. But as I tell everybody, there were scarier things in Amityville besides that house, depending on what part of town, town you were in. It was a very violent neighborhood. I experienced a lot of violence growing up there. And there was there's some question as to how much the Amityville horror story was contrived by the people who were living there. There were definitely murders there. Like that part is no, there's no question about it. The DeFeo family was brutally killed. There's still some question as to by who, but uh, then the book that came out of it about the haunting, a lot of that may have been contrived or manufactured for um, what do you call it? Promotional purposes. In other words. So, that's a heck of a heck of a way to promote your uh, book or movie, right? Well, I mean, it, it worked because we're still talking about it here tonight in the year 2022. <laughs> it sure did. <laughs> on your program. Yeah, so I was, um, I was having these abduction experiences, which I didn't really understand at the time. And I was always dabbling in these sort of, uh, I don't want to call it sci-fi, and I don't want to call them conspiracy theories, because the, the term conspiracy theory gets so played out these days. They're more like um, mysteries, you know, things like Arthur C. Clarke's World of Strange Powers, Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious Universe, In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. Uh, Sightings was a big one, the Linda Moulton Howe produced show uh, that came out in the early 90s. I believe it was 1990 when that one came out. Unsolved uh, Mysteries from uns the 80s and 90s, yeah. Yeah, Unsolved Mysteries. Um, there was just a very rich atmosphere of, well, so I guess paranormal is the best word I can come up with right now. You know, these words lose meaning after a while. You throw them around so often, paranormal, conspiracy theory, you know, it, it kind of loses its, its, um, its meaning. But what got me about these shows, and anybody who's ever seen any of these shows would know, is that they were produced very seriously. You know, there was a serious attempt at investigation. Cosmos with um, Carl Sagan, that was the other type of one. 
it was it was produced and handled very seriously. It wasn't made light of, and it wasn't sensationalized. Is the other thing. Like when you see these ghost hunting shows today, you can tell there's a lot of sensationalism that goes on with it. You know, you don't know. Oh, there's a noise and the camera turns real quick. These earlier shows, if you're fortunate enough to have caught them from that era, they were done almost like a detective would would investigate a serious crime that had occurred. And so it was really, um, it I was really very lucky, I think, to be exposed to that kind of thing because it was it was taking the paranormal seriously, something that kind of, you know, it shouldn't have been happening at that time in America because these things were still very taboo at the time. And I think that's one of the reasons they had to handle it on television with the utmost seriousness because of how crackpot it seemed at the time. You know, because when I told people like, hey, these little beings are taking me out of my bedroom at night, uh, it got me a visit to the psychiatrist and, you know, a Catholic priest and everything like that. And I was stigmatized and I never really fit in anywhere anyway. So that didn't kind of bother me all too much. But it wasn't there, nobody had ever considered the fact that maybe this guy's telling the truth. And um, one of the other things that got me, this is very rare that anybody saw this. There was a mini series that was put on television in the early 90s. I think it was 92 called Intruders. It was based on a book by Bud Hopkins, who's a very famous uh, UFO researcher. And that was another, it was the only time I had seen the abduction phenomena handled with some seriousness also on primetime television. And it was a dramatization. And I haven't seen anything like that. Maybe Fire in the Sky comes close, that movie, Fire in the Sky. So and I handled it investigatively without stigma, without making fun of it, uh, without demonization, just like an investigative, like the other shows. Right. And also, and most importantly, without trying to justify it, you know, they would genuinely look for other explanations. They wouldn't, uh, like a lot of the paranormal shows that come out today, like there are ghosts here, we're, ex we're experiencing ghosts, the ghosts are touching us, and you don't know if they are or not. It's just so, like I said, sensationalized. It's so over-sensationalized. Yeah. You know, I don't know what to believe on those shows. So, and I, like I said, I, I was starting to say, I hate to be so insidery here if other people hadn't seen these things, but they are, you know, kind of what formed me in the paranormal aspect of my life at the time, you know, and, and dabbling around with recording and videotape and audio tape was something completely different. It never occurred to me that these two would ever merge in my life. And when you found, uh, well, you know, the when I think of the first time uh, that you had a broadcast or, or first time that you were on television live nationwide, uh, I go back to the uh, human rights application that you were doing. Is that something that you were going to also tap in on? Yeah, that was something, you know, you don't. Somebody told me one time, and it's proved to be true. I can't remember who told me this. It wasn't any, it was somebody in my life that I had run across some some acquaintance or whatever that usually it's not really the big things that happen in your life that make the most changes. It's the little tiny decisions you make that somehow end up changing your life. And that has proven to be true more than anything. Um, I don't want to go. This is a, this is a topic that we could do a whole show on. And indeed I've been parts of numerous documentaries and symposia about the topic. But when I first became aware of the problem of infant genital mutilation, male and female circumcision is what it's colloquially known as, but infant genital mutilation, I was against this immediately. And so I started out essentially what people would call an anti-circumcision activist today. Uh, and I was very heavily involved with that for years. And yes, I was, I was on a lot of television programs and radio programs for that. My very first appearance on national broadcast uh, was Good Morning America in, I believe it was March of 2001. Yeah, it was March of 2001. And it was a very different time back then. It was, this was before the internet really became what it is today. Yes, the internet's been around since, you know, the late 70s, if you want to go back that far. But even in 2001, the internet was not, like, we couldn't do what you and I are doing right now. You know, there was no live broadcasting. We couldn't even probably upload a video of this length to the internet at the time in any reasonable fashion and then have somebody watch it in a meaningful way. The technology yeah. just wasn't there. So if you wanted to be, if you wanted to have national attention, you had to be invited by the, what we now call gatekeepers, the, the gatekeepers of media. And um, 
and they found me and they, and they didn't do it because they believed in my case or anything like that. They tried to paint me as some kind of lunatic, one of these man bites dog stories. Um, you know, and, and so, but anyway, I handled it with much grace. And that's when I realized that I kind of had a flair for this. I was obviously very nervous. I'm not even going to pretend that I wasn't, but I conducted myself wonderfully. You'd never really know that I was a 19 year old kid. Yeah. I was there in a nice suit talking. I was Charlie Gibson and Diane Sawyer at the time. Um, yeah, that would be my, my first broadcast. And from that, as an anti-circumcision activist, I had done other things. I was on the Penn & Teller show. I was in Newsweek magazine. Um, Penthouse magazine did a write-up about me, Playboy magazine. Uh, I believe it was the Daily News. I was on the Adam Carolla radio program years ago. And, I, you know, I started becoming much more... I was always a good speaker, you know, but I had never gone into such a wider audience as, as I did when I was on Good Morning America. And then from there, I just kept getting bigger and bigger audiences. And uh, I was in the Air Force at the time while I was doing all this, which made it, which made it particularly interesting because the Air Force would always have to take me aside before I went on television to tell me what I could and couldn't say. And I certainly couldn't represent the Air Force or anything like that. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Oh, yeah. The Air Force, any, any branch of the military has an office of public affairs and you have to you have to see them. Any serviceman, if anybody out there is in the service or a veteran, you'll know they basically own you. You know, you couldn't just I couldn't just appear on Good Morning America without the Air Force knowing about it because I was on active duty at the time. I see. I do. I have another friend named William uh, and he does his own uh live stream show and uh gaming live streams and he also does a show that he does every couple weeks and it's called retro rewind and they invite other gamers and streamers to come in and chat and one guy came in and he's never been able to show his face on video and they asked him why and it wasn't because he was active military but he works in the government official office and they tell them right up front, if you are in the internet, you cannot use your face, you cannot use your real name. So he had to create a, a whole thing about not putting his face on camera. And, and they went into quite uh, depth of it. But I, I should have assumed the military did that. My dad was in the military too. But I didn't realize even doing a interview on your off time, uh, as long as it wasn't saying anything derogatory about the country or about the military was off limits without permission. Yeah, see, that's the thing. When you're on active duty, there is no off time. You're with the government 24-7. You know, and on that note, though, Rob, actually, isn't it interesting? You'll remember how back in the day we were having a national conversation about how important it was to never reveal your true identity on the Internet. And now, fast forward 25 years later, and, you know, you got to send in your, your government driver's license for them to reactivate your Facebook account. They want to know who you are and prove you're not a robot and like, Oh, just answer these questions from your credit history. So we know it's you. Yeah. I was infuriated when Twitter shut down my account. I, I had, I was at the hospital, uh, with the baby having her surgery. And then I got home and all of a sudden I started getting all of these, uh, erectile dysfunction pill adverts on all of my pages and all of these medical pharmaceutical uh, adverts. So I put a picture of that and said, gotta love the medical industry or something like that on Twitter. And they said, you can't come back on unless you give us your phone number. And I'm like, dude, I've never given my phone number to any. I use my email. I've even given my, my driver's license to Facebook when someone uh, went on a um, mass, uh, mass flagging spree and had everyone flag my account as fake because they didn't like something I'd said in a channeling. And I even did that, but I was like, my phone number is sacred. I don't give this to anyone. Uh, very few people in the world have it. It's, it's for my, for my family and friends or for, uh, you know, emergencies for, for Jeremy, things like that. But no, I'm not going to. So I went months without it until I had to use it to uh, share something that I was doing in work. And then I finally begrudgingly gave it, but it, it, it seems so ridiculous to me that they had all my identity. I was using my real name. <laughs> I would have sent them an ID, but no, nope, they need your phone number too. I didn't use it from my phone, so they didn't have access to that information. It was just really ridiculous. Well, it's part of an overall orchestrated data mining project, you know, to, to figure out who and what everybody is doing. That's why I still have my old AOL email addresses. I've got a bunch of AOL email addresses that I opened anonymously in 1995 that I never had to provide anything for. Yeah. Occas occasionally when I log in, 
they're like, uh, uh, dear bagel pimp, would you like to please provide your cell phone number? I'm like, no, I would not like to provide my cell phone number. Well, now everybody people. knows how to get a hold of me, bagel pimp. <laughs> yeah, that. Well, that's just one of my many, um, my many AOL addresses. I'm so glad. I thank my my previous self for every time when I have all these AOL email addresses anonymously at my disposal. Yeah, I actually have one, uh, a couple of my AOL two that I started in 1996. So, so literally, you know, at this point, they're almost 20 years uh, of age. And then um, I had it linked to my PayPal before I started uh, the Treb channeling uh, email address. And someone wrote to me and was like, I don't know if I want to have the session. I, I look and I see this name of a mafia killer. It was in 1996, the first time I saw the, the Godfather movie with Luca Brazzi. Yeah. So it was like Luca Brazzi at AOL or whatever. And I, I had to go back and explain. I was like, this is an email address I, I haven't used for 20 years. I only had it initially connected because it was the only active email uh, that I had that I could, you know, easily oh, yeah. use and access. But. Yeah. Well, that's why I mentioned Bagel Pimp because it's connected to my PayPal, which I've had for you know forever. <laughs> so, believe me, the other ones I won't give out so easily. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't blame it. So, take take us to this part here now, where you got this broadcasting. You're, you're in this uh, a prolific figure in the anti circumcision movement. Um, you've been uh, dabbling and, and broadcasting and, and doing things at home, and you have all these experiences with metaphysics. How how and why did you start your YouTube channel? Because your YouTube channel is actually quite separate from your experiences with abductions. Uh, it may have some part to do with the anti-circumcision movement, but you started a, a politics channel. What, what led you to do that? What led you to be Fincastle Underground? Well, in 1994, I moved to Fincastle, Virginia, where I'm talking to you from now. And I had lived here. I went to high school down here. Uh, then I left for the Air Force. And I got back here in 2003. Um, you know, and I was really down. I was really down and out. It was a bad time in my life. You know, I was, uh, I had just gotten out of the Air Force, which led to, I, I ended up battling alcoholism for a number of years. That was not a pleasant time in my life. Um and it was part of, um, I don't know, it's really difficult to say that, Rob, because there's so many factors that went into it to, to pulling that out of me. Part of it was that I, the last time I ever had a job working for somebody else was back in 2014. I worked at the Social Security Administration. And that was... Um, that was a job that sent me back into drinking again, and I just wasn't happy. And I knew all this metaphysical stuff. Let me take you back to 2004 first. That's when I read my first Seth's book, or Seth Speaks by Jane Roberts in 2004. And I wanted to, um, I, you know, I was compelled to live that lifestyle. I wanted to, you know, but I didn't know how to. You know, you read all this stuff. When you read metaphysics, whether it's Seth or Arta for Treb's teachings, the guys that you channel, or, or whoever your your go-to channelers are, and there's a number of good ones out there. I think you're one of the best ones working today, Rob. That's my opinion. But I appreciate that. <laughs> there's a number of good ones out there. When, when you listen to Abraham Hicks or or Bashar or or Treb or even Seth, when you're in it and it's playing, and you're like, yeah, this is great. I got this. I'm on top of the world. And then, like, you put down the book, you turn off the cassette tape or whatever, and then you go back and like, well, I'm still making, you know, like. $600 a month working as a custodian, stealing people's gas, just to, you know, it's a very, it's, it's difficult to put it in practice uh, or it can be. It's a cultivated experience in order to, to truly live the life you want to live, which sh shouldn't be so hard to just live the life that you want to live, but it, it's taken me years. So in 2004, I got heavily into the Seth material and I read everything I can get my hands on from Seth absolutely everything and as i've talked with you before in other shows that we've done i was fortunate enough that this was before the great internet age as i said the internet was still there but unless you were like logging in from a desktop someplace it wasn't part of your everyday life so i would hang out in the back of this giant 1984 cadillac that i had and i would just read at the library i would read and i would drift off to sleep sometimes and i had a number of out-of-body experiences and so I knew, I was convinced that this material was legitimate and it could work and it could be put into practice. But getting 
from that point to self-actualization has been a long road. And so, as I said, over the next 10 years, I had a, did a bunch of things, some of which are worth mentioning, many which are not. <laughs> <laughs> but 2014, I had my last job at the Social Security Administration, as I was saying earlier. And it was miserable. It was absolutely miserable because it was nothing but sad horror stories all day, every day, like Miss Lonely Hearts. People coming in with the most gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching stories, and you want to help them as a fellow human being. And then you find out they were scamming you or something, or, you know, it's their story is not true. They're just trying to get the benefits out of you. Or and it, the vice versa with people who really need help and you try to get them and can't get it. And mm -hmm. they really actually needed it. Yeah. Yeah. That was the next, the very next thing I was going to say. And the, and the total uh, reversal of that were people who need help, they're not getting it. And the con artists always seem to do. It's the same thing I saw at the VA, you know, the veterans that needed help, they weren't getting the help that they needed by and large. You know, and that was, I worked at the VA back in 2007. So um, I had another incident with the law. I got a DUI after being a, uh, an alcoholic that, for that period of time. And I realized that something had to change. Like right as, right before I got that DUI, I had come up with this idea that I could make money if I could just purchase and operate a series of ATM machines. So I took all the cash that I had. Uh, it cost me dearly. They turned off my power. I couldn't pay some of my bills, but I, in fact, bought my very first ATM. And I got arrested, and they delivered the ATM to the location that it was supposed to be operating at while I was in rehab at the VA, trying to avoid a lengthy prison sentence for my crimes of DUI. So um, fortunately, everything worked out. I got my first... Um, I got my first ATM up and running. I was able to get past my, my alcoholism. And a lot of it came down to the fact that um, simultaneously with me forming this new business, that I now had something that I could work towards, that I wasn't working for other people anymore, even though I wasn't making anything. The first couple months I was in business, I think I made like $12 or something like that. Uh, well, now I own dozens of machines all over the state, and I'm the third largest private ATM company in the state of Virginia at this time. You know, now this is seven years later. But it was it was part of this, um, and I hate to tie it to, to finances so much, but I know a lot of people out there struggle with finances. But it was part of this idea of becoming self-actualized financially that also went hand in hand with my spiritual development, in a sense, that really sunk it home. You know, I knew all these things on an intellectual level, but now I was really starting to put it into practice, you know, and actually not worrying. If something catastrophic seemed to happen in front of me, I'd be like, no, this is part of, uh, of the universal plan. Everything's going to work out. I just have to try and get the best out of this situation I possibly can. And it's, it's hard to do that. It's rare people that can do that. It's a cultivated attitude to have. Yeah, it's, it's 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 not just hard for a lot of people. It, it's almost impossible for some people. Some people go through uh, so much that they feel emotionally unable to to reach that mindset. And and that something, as you know, with me personally, that I've struggled with uh, for my whole whole existence in the spiritual community. But it always based around my kids. You know, my life, I don't care. You know, something bad happens to me. I'm like, all right, suck it up. I'll, I'll deal with it. But when it comes to the kids, it's it's devastating. So some people can't even imagine that process. And I imagine that's probably where a lot of the Jane Roberts material had come into uh, reinforcing that mindset. And, and by this time, I'm sure that you had already checked out lots of other channelings and whatnot. Um I mean, is this part of the the experience of the mental changes that you made that where you could just flip that switch and say hardship or not, I'm I'm going forward? Well, you know, it was always I grew up in one of those old school families. My father was a tree surgeon, therefore I was a tree surgeon at age six, running a wood splitter with him. Uh, you know how it is. You did the same thing, Rob. When you're younger, your your parent has a craft, you're basically doing it with them. Yeah. You know, anybody that's ever lived on a farm knows this. So I was used to like doing hard stuff and just pushing through and accepting that, you know, life is hard and you just do your best at it and that's it. But the real change was that, yes, I can work hard, but do am, am I enjoying the hard work that I'm doing? Because there's a difference to it, you know, slaving away for somebody else 
or you know anybody out there some have has had the experience i hope where you have some project you're working on a hobby a weekend project a construction project and you're just into it you don't want to stop you're busting your ass the sun's going down and you're setting up lights to keep doing whatever it was you're doing you don't even want to sleep like that's a different type of hard work than basically slaving away for the social security administration or you know, working at a factory, or all the being a custodian, or all the hundred and one things I had to do before I got here. Um, it's work. I, I want to touch too back on on that and thing. Sorry to interrupt. The, you, you talked about you know working with your dad and and just putting your head down and going. Me and you have talked about this several times. Also, uh, our fathers were at the end of the silent generation or at the beginning of, of the baby boomer generation, and that generation of men taught their sons to do exactly that you don't complain put your head down push through and get it done and that was kind of the archetype of energy we had uh, growing up and also something that was instilled in us deeply from the time we were kids on up yeah it is and it's um it's really self-destructive because there's a lot of old religious ideas old catholic ideas tied to this that there's uh, nobility and suffering, that poverty is somehow ennobling, uh, you know, that working hard is um, idle hands of the devil's playground, like those kinds of Old Testament ideas play into this a lot. And there's a lot of generational trauma. Um, I'm dealing with it now. I know other people my ages are dealing with it now. If you've got a kid who's like 19 or 20 years old or something like that, and they're nothing like what we were. And I know every generation has this sort of intergenerational tension, but um, they have no, by and large, I hate to generalize, but I am a sociologist. That's another thing I did in between 2004 and 2014. I got, I got uh, bachelor's degrees and became a sociologist. But, um, and so sociologists are basically generalizers, which, you know, I know everybody's a unique, specialized individual. But sometimes generalizations, you know, there are some some validity in that. And this younger generation, uh, I'm talking to other people my age that have kids my daughter's age. They don't seem to want to get driver's licenses. We literally had to force my daughter to get a driver's license. And I know other parents recounting the same story. Like, I don't understand. They don't want a driver's license. They don't want to go out. It's hard for them to keep work. They don't, they're not uh, socially adept. You know, they can't communicate with people in real life. And everything and so i end i'm trying to because i have a daughter this age and also because i live on the planet and you know i have to deal with younger people a lot i'm trying to understand them and part of me is like why don't you get it together and you know start working and you know pull, pull your life together and then the other part of me is like well how much of that are really damaging beliefs that i have from the last generation like that i'm now trying to enforce on this generation you know maybe the best thing to do is not to work <laughs> <laughs> well you recognize too that how much of that is is your dad speaking through you you know Same right with what the, what i deal with when i communicate with some of those beliefs that did come from the the silent generation and boomer generation well i know from dealing with infant genital mutilation male and female circumcision just how damaging the beliefs of older generations can be enforced on future generations so I'm very sensitive to that particular topic. Um, you know, you can mentally scar someone just as easily as physically. And there's a lot of outdated belief systems, you know, to go to kind of jump to a more current time period, Rob. And this is something we talk about on the Patreon show sometimes is that and, and Trev and Artif talk about this as well. This isn't just my own personal musings is the destruction of every major social system that our society has come to rely on. The medical community is falling apart at the seams, the, the higher education system, the public school system, the lower education system, um, the government, the uh, government law enforcement, system, everything. Yeah. Yeah. I can't even name them all. Um, the law enforcement community, the legal system, you know, the legal system in this country is so outdated and abused and misused uh, where it's, I think, perhaps one of the most nefarious legal systems we have because it, it is truly unjust. And yet, because we're living in the United States of America, people masquerade around as if we have a model legal, like we have the best legal system in the world. And that couldn't be further from the truth at this point. 
that's a whole other aspect of my yeah i was gonna say we'll, we'll come up into the law enforcement portion of, of that soon too but back to to where you were and i i am sorry i interrupted you were talking about these systems of, of working with your dad and how it led you to the fin castle underground i know and thanks for keeping me on track with that <laughs> sorry. i forgot myself for a sec oh well um yeah so after uh, after I started my ATM business and I got through my alcoholism and legal troubles and things, uh, it was I was clicking right along. I was buying more ATMs and I'd become interested in politics around 2015, 2016, um, particularly 2016 with the 2016 presidential election. And I had always considered myself informed only to find out that I didn't understand the half of it. You know, I had always been kind of suspicious of the media and everything, but there was something, something was just calling to me about this new medium. I had, I had bought all these supercomputers cause I got into Bitcoin mining and I had gotten a building in, uh, well, we won't say where I got the building <laughs> for safety reasons, but I, I had acquired a building somewhere in my County that had fiber optic internet so that I could set up all my Bitcoin mining equipment. And I I learned a little bit more about computers and everything and how they were put together. And I even built a computer and there was just something about it. Something started appealing to me about YouTube. Like, Oh, I could just go on. I could just go on the internet and tell people what's up, you know? So I'm like, maybe I'll do a, a news broadcast. And if you look at some of my earlier shows, I'm wearing a suit and tie and I'm basically posing as a news broadcaster. It's not satire. It's just, to me, that was the most logical way to present the news because that's what I had grown up with, is that I should put on a suit and tie and I should come, I should read news reports and, you know, give some opinion about it. And uh, I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, and I never, I never did this because I wanted to be a YouTuber. I had no expectations about who would watch and how many people would watch. And eventually it, it got to the point where I was getting a quarter million views and before YouTube terminated my channel, for wrong think, uh, I had nineteen and a half thousand subscribers. Yeah, some some of the views you had on certain videos, like you said, were in the quarter million to three hundred thousand plus uh, viewing ranges. Oh, I was very I was very popular. I was making a lot of money doing that. That's not why I had gotten into it. Um, but I'm not going to pretend that the money's not nice. Uh, it was. I was doing a bona fide news report, and I was taking taking it very seriously while having fun. Not you know. You've probably figured out I'm not exactly a stuffed shirt kind of guy. I'm <laughs> very, very laid back. But I was taking it seriously in that I was being professional about it and putting forth my my best honest effort to kind of an analyze what was going on in the news. And it was it was definitely it had more conservative leanings, uh, which I don't know that that will sit well with everybody who's listening tonight. But perhaps we can get past that and talk about you know the things we do have in common. But that's, I was. That's really actually what I was just going to say. As much as some people don't like the conservative idealism or, or conservative concepts, uh, to to me, you are much more than that. We have a lot of things that we agree on in life. Some things that we haven't always fully agreed on, but come to the consensus of why it's important. But the majority of the fact is, whether whether. You're, you're on one side or the other. I think the common bond, and this is what I've been saying about politics for uh, the last four or five years, everyone wants better for everyone else. Everyone wants the best for their self and their family and those around them, their community, the country, uh, the world, whatever the case is. And I think if that's the starting point, then we can start realizing why no one can come to a consensus, which is actually the in America, at least, the two-party system, uh, the, the the spectrum uh, of duality within it, and the hardcore, you know, black and white with no gray allowed. And if you, you fall on this side of this belief, you are this, and if you fall on that side. But, you know, between me and you, I think both of us have very conservative and very uh, liberal ideas when it comes to how things should be in the world, uh, and and those few things that we haven't always uh, necessarily 100% agreed upon, both of us can understand the other perspective. And this is one thing that I feel you did well. Even though you presented the information, you didn't mind when someone else would come in and say, hey, the, I don't think that that's the reason. And if they weren't being a troll, 
and actually shared or expressed an opinion that wasn't the same as yours, you, you didn't treat them with, with any disrespect or disregard, you're like, yeah, okay, yeah, you, you know, I, I can see why you think that, but, you know, it wasn't contentious, and that's why I enjoyed watching you, even if you're doing a, a show on a topic that I am much more left on mm -hmm. than you would be, you did it by expressing the idea and why you thought it was best. And to me, that's the most beautiful thing in the world, because even with those two different ideologies, if the purpose behind the ideology is to help people, to me, that's what it's about. Right. Well, I've been, I've had many affiliations in my life and see, this is the point where I want everyone who's listening right now to understand that words really do fail at some point. When I say that I was doing, I had more conservative leanings, it's only for the sake of simplicity to kind of under, you know, get across the message of what I was doing. Now, am, am I a, a, a dyed in the wool Republican? Certainly not. Certainly not. <laughs> I, I had a real interest in Ross Perot back in the day. This is before I ever seriously got involved in politics at all, but we're talking. What is it, 1991 and 92? Mm -hmm. I'm like, who's this Ross Perot guy? Like, that guy intrigued me. But when I was, um, uh, and I, I'm not going to get political, but just at the, um, for the sake of describing where I'm coming from, uh, I joined the Air Force in 99 under Clinton. I signed up in 99. He was in office. Had no particular feelings about him at the time. Now, you got to remember, I'm a high school student. You know, how, what the hell do high school students know about anything anyway? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, politics is the last thing on, on a high school mind usually. Right. It's the 90s. Things are going good. Gas is like 93 cents a gallon. I just want to join the Air Force and get out of my rinky dink little town. You know, so I get in and this is all before 9-11. So I'm in the Air Force. The Air Force before 9-11 was like a government funded frat party. It was like a police academy movie or Animal House or something. You know, we were just chilling. It was a good time. Then 9-11 happened and things got really serious and, and quite frankly, very dark. Um, but when I got out of the military, uh, you know, I started seeing some of the, I, I started seeing the consequences of what was happening as a result of these wars. I'm very anti-war, no matter which party is in power. I don't, I don't think that that's necessary right now at all. Um, you know, so I was against George Bush at the time because I had seen the devastation that he had wrought upon people that I knew because I was a military veteran and I've got pictures of me actively campaigning for John Kerry at the time. <laughs> which is hilarious to think of now, you know, and then Ron Paul came along. I was a Ron Paul guy for a while. Uh, and then yes, ultimately I ended up supporting Donald Trump for the year that for the years that he was in office. And it's only, um, uh, but there's other things now, you know, it's not, um, it's not this sort of cult of personality for me. Yeah. There's some trolling that goes along with it, but, the nature of who I am, I would never blindly follow any individual besides myself to anywhere. Oh, so and that was the interesting thing to me. Whenever you would say, hey, you know, this guy's talking, you know, talking about Donald Trump on your show, you'd say this guy's saying a lot of stuff, but I want to see if he's being honest because anyone who can stand in the podium can lie. Mm -hmm. I hope that what he's saying is true. And you had people ripping you apart. Like, how dare you second guess this man? How dare you... Uh, throw his name in the mud and i'm thinking <laughs> the last the whole previous part of the program you're talking about the good things you saw that you thought he was doing and you know uh expressing your understanding for people who didn't like him first person what, whatever the case was and these people just ripped you apart and i was thinking you know you're trying to come to it from a place as neutral as you can or or from a perspective that you can but these people who are are leaning just in one direction refuse to look in, into any other direction. Um, the people who who disliked them hated you anyway because you said things positive about them. And then the people who followed him so wholly that they were almost addicted to that energy, then they would crucify you anytime you had any type of reservation or any complaint on his performance. And and it blows my mind. You know, that's why I never really liked politics. I know a lot about it. Uh, I, I'm invested in the outcome of my fellow human beings. So I know that that directly affects them, whoever's in office uh, or, or whatever's going on in the government. But to see people so hard lined and one sided in it, 
it was really frustrating, especially to someone uh, who's actually trying to to share the information of what they like about the person they like. I I, I knew why people who were um, liberal didn't like you. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody who didn't like Donald Trump w would really stand much for anything that was said semi-positive, neutral, or really positive about them. Um, just like yeah. now you're seeing it with the Biden and conservatives. Anybody who says anything, oh, well, Biden didn't do too bad here. They get the onslaught from from the right on that. No, it's true, and I don't. Um, I have to say, I was a little naive thinking that rationality would prevail. You know, see, in the past when I was doing media before the internet, you know, like television, you know, you might get some hate mail from a crackpot or a crank or something like that, but nothing like the outpouring of hate that you can get on the internet. Uh, it even happened, and before people think they have an idea of you know who I am or any, like because I happened to support Donald Trump. Uh, now would probably be a good time to interject that I ran for sheriff in my county as an independent on a very strong uh, prison reform platform and anti-war on drugs platform, getting people into uh, treatment rather than just locking up everybody for anything that they possibly could. And um, decriminalization of marijuana. Decriminal, yes, because there's a lot of people out here now. They want to do uh, medical treatment with psychedelic mushrooms, and um, you know other things, not just not just drug related. Bringing back a true constitutional form of law enforcement, where you're not just a tool of the state running around writing tickets for license plates, and you know, uh, it, w it was going to be very much uh, a hands-on, community-oriented type of law enforcement. You know, and it wasn't going to be this, um, it would probably be the exact opposite of conservative in some respects. It would be more constitutional because, like I said, a lot of the people today that masquerade as Democrats and Republicans, it's so far removed from what I think America was intended to be. Yeah, and that's one thing that I've I've seen with you that that's really helped me understand you as a person is your love for for the United States as a country, your love for the way that the Constitution was intentionally intended to give people equality and freedom and, and not be suppressed or pushed. And to me, regardless of, of what person you choose for president or what person you think would do the best job, you put your money where your mouth is and actually went out and went for office so that you could make an active better life for people around you by not wanting them to be suppressed by giving them the freedom that they're supposed to be offered and that to me is is amazing because everything Trevor and Arnif have ever said always bends around free will it always talks about the manifestation of your good life comes from your free will and your ability to act on your free will and the world not just america the world has created so many laws uh, to prevent people from being able to do it. Like a license. When you get a license, the definition of a license is it's basically the government giving you a certificate to do something that's not legal. Mm -hmm. Getting married is, is not legal unless you get a permit from the government to break that law. Going fishing, going hunting. These are things... You're not supposed to do unless you pay the fee t to break the law. And to me, that's that's not free will. That's the opposite of free will. Right. Well, you had said, I'm going to, and I'm sure you misspoke when you're talking about when I ran for sheriff to give people the freedom that they were entitled to. It's not my freedom to give. And I think this is where that people just have freedom. We are endowed with that freedom by our universal creator, whoever that may be in your particular belief system. And that's exactly the point. I understand that there's a lot of, believe me, my father was American Indian. I understand the failings of the United States of America as far as the government goes and the problems we've had in this country along the way. But I think what we can do where America and this metaphysical worldview can be run parallel to each other is that I firmly believe as long as you're not hurting anyone else in this country, you should be able to do whatever you want. That was the original idea of the Founding Fathers, is that you can be self-actualized, that you could pursue who you were as an individual, discover yourself, and do it completely uninhibited by the, the government or systems around you, as long as you didn't hurt anyone else. Or infringe on their free will to do exactly the same thing. 
Right. And now when I say that, people say, well, you're a libertarian because people want to label everything all the time, every, every step of the way. You're like, well, it, it sounds like you're a libertarian. Well, no, I'm just a human being who wants to be left alone. And the people freedom to do that too, which, which is the fascinating thing behind. And this is one of the biggest problems I've had with politics in general. Politics is divisive in a way that puts people in these categories and pins them up against people. Um, I've seen people being uh, sanctioned as um, a racist or a communist because they didn't have the right belief or the right thing to say or the right thing to do. But when you talk to the person and say, why do you believe, you know, that that uh, immigration should be uh, held up and why, um, you know, there should be an extension on public service programs for people to give uh, money to give food to people who can't make it themselves. Why is this? Why do you feel that way? And when they explain, they have legitimate, caring, and loving reasons most of the time if you're talking about normal people. But the people who get deeply attached to these labels and ideas draw that line so heavily in the sand that you can't be. Uh, you know, you can't not be a racist if you're believing in, in a certain type of immigration law, or you can't not be a communist if you think people deserve to be cared for by the government. And to me, the intention behind the belief is always, always the most important thing for me. And that's why this is something that I do that I, I wished I could see more people do, but I understand why they don't is try to be open to understanding why someone believes the way that they do instead of just labeling them as a lost cause or labeling them as a bigot or a, a commie or whatever to literally sit in and discuss these things and the reasons why they feel or believe it i mean we do that as family members some mm -hmm. people have families that are so contentious they don't even like talking to their family members about certain subjects or about anything yet they can still put their differences aside to come together for uh, whatever holiday or get together and they can do that why can't we do that with our neighbors why can't we do that with the people living in the next state why can't we do it with people living in the next country and just try to figure out why why the problems being solved i in my opinion and i know this is kind of a cynical opinion and, and a lot of people tell me, you know, that's not the right way to think. It's, it's only going to bring more negativity. But I think people who are in control of the laws and people who are in control of those uh, coveted government seats, they would rather people be fighting and arguing so that you're not pushing them to do the right thing. Instead, you're just saying, oh, yeah, well, hey, the Republicans are saying this now. I better get behind them. Or, hey, the Democrats are doing this. I better jump and rally. Well, it's that's easier. why yeah. having my show canceled was probably not the worst thing that could have happened to me because when I, when you're doing those kinds of things, um, you know, I was involved in political hardball for like six years. I wasn't just casually commenting on the news. Like I was, I was in the studio. It consumed my life. And since my show has been canceled, um, yeah, I could have carried on on other platforms, and I occasionally put out content. But I live out in the middle of Appalachia. I live in the middle of nowhere. And just to touch on some of the things that you're talking about is that there are a lot of a lot of things that people are preoccupied with don't actually matter. When you live in the country and you're communicating with the land and you don't have some job taking up all your time and you could sit back and you watch how the animals exist and you have a garden and you're growing your own food and you don't turn on the TV, guess what? Suddenly the world has no problems. Oh, just like that, just as magically, the world has no problems. Now, if you're living somewhere in a metropolitan area, a suburb, an apartment complex, it it puts you a level away from that experience. It's not that you couldn't find your own inner peace in those situations, but um, it certainly it certainly is an obstacle. Because out here, once I stopped tuning into the news every day, once I didn't have Facebook or Twitter and all that stuff going on, and I'm just watching the birds show up, and I'm in touch with the changing of the seasons, and I'm mowing my grass, and I don't—I have no idea what's going on. And um, I would highly recommend that for a lot of people. 
Well, this is something that you said many times that that you you don't like uh, living in the cities. That cities kind of have a draw into people. It, we're dealing with that living in Kalamazoo in town. Uh, it's a beautiful town, uh, lovely people that live here, but there's also a lot of people stacked on top of each other, especially living in an apartment. And me and Kalina have gotten that same bug. We want to get out of town and, and kind of set it behind us and, you know, come to town when we need to get things and be able to enjoy a little bit of country. But not everyone can do that. Not everybody wants to do that. A lot of people love the city, the conveniences, the social networks that they've created, friends, family. So how, how does someone in the city that's surrounded by kind of structured chaos, how do they achieve that when you look at all the teachings that you've heard through Seth and, and through, uh, you know, all, all of these channelers or spiritual teachers? Um, how can one do that? Well, I mean, if they're loving it, then there's really no problem. You know, I would be speaking to the people that are living this existence, and it's just the bleak sort of miserable... Uh, you've seen these this this dystopian city life. It's I, I I remember I was from New York in the 80s and 90s. You know that was kind of peak city living for me. And I realized when I go back there that there's people that live in that city. They might live there their whole lives, and their bare feet will never touch the earth. Like just think of that. I, it's um it's a disconnection from the natural world. How would you do something like that? I don't know. I, if my father were alive today, I would thank him endlessly for getting us out of New York because at the time there was a big ad campaign, get out of New York state before it's too late. And he did. And it's the best thing ever. Um, I would tell people, cause here's the example I use, you know, with, with the rise of Facebook and everything, whenever that became a thing about 10, 11 years ago, when I got on it, I started reconnecting with people that I hadn't seen since I left New York. And they're on there and they're complaining about how bad life is and all these problems they have with life. And I'm reading this and I, it occurred to me, I'm like, these are not life problems. These are New York problems. If you didn't live in New York, you wouldn't be having any of these problems. In fact, <laughs> you wouldn't have the city creeping around and the sanitation workers writing you tickets. And, you know, it, it, none of that would happen. You'd be living out in the country where you could do whatever you want. And it became very apparent to me at that time that cities... So many of the major uh, se se centers of our community, of our society, happen in cities. New York, Washington, D.C., L.A., Hollywood, uh, San Antonio. All the, these people congregate to cities, including our elected leaders. And these people think that there's all these problems with our society that is really just because they live in a city. <laughs> and they're just so out of touch with what happens in normal American small towns, which is the vast majority of the country. Uh, you know, I can understand if you were living in a city every day, if I had to wake up in Brooklyn every morning, I would think that the world is headed for disaster too. But no, I live yeah. in, fin <laughs> I live in Fincastle, Virginia. I wake up, the birds wake me up, the sun, it may or may not be raining. I could walk outside in my underwear. You know, I got plenty of property. Oh, you know, suddenly it doesn't look like the human, the human race is headed for a disaster. Suddenly it's just another spring morning. So I would just strongly caution you, if you live in one of these highly populated areas and you're not enjoying life, how much of it is because of your environment and because of your surroundings? Yeah, and, and the vice versa too. Like you said, if people are happy in the city, then, then they are doing exactly what they should be doing and, and enjoying that. And I think it is a special breed. Um, you know, I, I never grew up in a, in a large city. I've always been in a small town. Kalamazoo is like the big city. And, and my time with Kalina when she was in uh, Chicago, staying over with her was about the biggest. Even though I was on the road with my dad, we, we did most of our living in hotels in the big city. But it's not the same as living there every day, multiple years. Um, and when I was young, it was amazing. I loved it. It, it was the best thing ever, especially only coming from a small town but as i got older and the more people um the more people feel more free to do it and this is the thing too i don't want to infringe on my neighbor when they're awake at three in the morning listening to loud music but that directly wakes up the baby wakes up jeremy so it does affect me in that way and i don't want to be the one going hey you shouldn't be playing music but I also want my own free will. I want my own uh, non-interruption. So for me, it's just, 
it's a thing that passes as you get older. This time with yourself becomes more important. I think as you're younger, it's a little harder to be with yourself because you don't fully have that grasp of, of all of what you are yet because none of us know what we are. We, we grow into it. And that's why old people are, are the most amazing group of people to talk to because they know who they are a lot better than we, we do. Um, that's, that's a callback to how you opened up. Who is William Stowell? Yeah, yeah, we don't know. We still don't know. <laughs> After an hour and five minutes of talking about it, we still don't know. We still don't know. Well, that's the beautiful part. Um, you know, I, I'm going to continuously bug you to get your own show on this network until you say yes or, or until you don't. But because uh, I, I, I think the way you communicate through things and, and the way you share is very uh, interesting and very intriguing. But well, you know, I, I, I'm a little I don't want to interrupt you, Rob, but uh, we talked before the show. I'm a little hesitant to tell anybody that I did a conservative radio program for six years because I had the same thing over there. Um, even though I was quote unquote talking to my people, you know, again, quote unquote, and the conservative sphere, I would mention to them, okay, guys, well, if you like my politics and you like the political work I do, check out the work I do with the ET whisperer. And then I had all the Christian Christians mostly coming up to me. Well, of course the ET whisperer is talking to the devil, you know, so I'm going to pray for your soul tonight because you're talking to the devil when you're not here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that's the kind of thing. So it's like, I feel like whatever sphere of existence I'm in, there's always going to be people that take issue with you. Um, and I've been out there for so much now, there's no hiding who I am at this point. You know, a quick Google search will tell you everything. Um, yeah, you've you've dipped your toes in enough water. And that's, that's part of being a Capricorn, too. Um, is having your, your toes in a lot of different ponds at the time and kind of seeing what's best for you and then digging in where you are uh, most wanted, most needed or most excited to be. And that's the thing that always amazes me about you is how you can go through life as a Capricorn. I feel kind of um, deficient <laughs> in my Capricornism uh, mm -hmm. because I see how you're able to do a million things. And I know it's not as easy as it looks for you and, and that there's tough times that come with doing all these things at once, but you, you do, you have, such a wide array of, of experience and a wide array of, of hats that you have to wear that make you incredibly interesting to say the least. And I'm glad I've been able to be your friend for as long as I have and, and get to know you. But I also want people to get a chance to come in and talk to William and ask him questions too. Before we take any callers, is there anything you want to say that kind of encompasses or or wraps up the the things that we've been talking about like uh, now that your fincastle underground channel is is gone and done uh as far as the the main uh channel and and the consistent uploads that you were doing in the news broadcast what now uh does does mr william and or fincastle underground go what what's the next chapter well, uh, Fincastle Underground is more than just a YouTube channel. I It's a broadcast media service. So, like, there's another aspect of it. I run a page called the Botetot Public Affairs Network, which is uh, the local community. That, that's something that I do for the local community when I have time. I broadcast the um, Board of Supervisors meetings, the economic development, you know, boring civic meetings that people wouldn't normally have a chance to go to. I do that. Uh, I'm working on a film, The Mad Gasser of Botetot County, which maybe you can provide a link for the trailer in here. I'll get it to you before the end of the show. Sure. Uh, that's That was a true story that happened. I live in Botetot County, Virginia. Uh, that's where Fincastle is located. And back from December 22nd, 1933 to February 14th of 1934, there was a mad gasser that went around the community gassing people in their homes with hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, they never caught the guy. He, they couldn't figure out his motivations. He never stole anything. He wasn't a rapist. He wasn't a murderer. N none of the typical motivators, you know, for something like that. He was just going around gassing people with hallucinogens in their homes. And I find it to be a captivating story. So we're working on a film for that. It'll be coming out. God knows when. If the pandemic had never happened, we would have been a lot more on track. Uh, I'm working on. A, a serial television program with the ET Whisperer that 
<laughs> so yes, you that. are. That's that's the big one I, that I was gonna say too. Is uh, we've got the O'Neill not running uh, soon. It's a, it's in the process of being produced at this moment, and eventually we'll, <laughs> we'll get a produced uh, finished product out there too, because I think that'll be amazing. Um, I, uh, tell us quickly. I've got the trailer, but I don't have it uploaded here, which was my fault for not uh, getting it uploaded. But tell everybody what the O'Neill knot is too, because that's something we're going to be doing together. So I think a lot of people will be super excited to hear. Well, that's that's a call back to what I was saying earlier. We, all those shows that I had listed off and cataloged at the beginning of the show from the early '80s and '90s: Arthur C. Clarke, Carl Sagan, um, sightings. It, um, Rob was raised on some of those, and also our director, Ian Kyle, uh, who's a very talented director here in Virginia. He deals with the Rusty Wallace racing experience for NASCAR, and he's the chief um, film guy for the Smart Tour, if anybody out there is into auto racing. But the Oneira Knot is where, because Ian also is the same age as Rob and I, and was also raised on these old time mystery shows. And we're sitting around talking about different topics. I don't want to give it away because some of them will be revealed in the show. And like, I wonder what happened with this particular mystery. This is how it went down, actually. I was watching a YouTube video about this particular mystery. And I called Ian. Uh, he and I worked together on other projects. And he was reading a book about the same mystery. And we were wondering what happened. And I'm like, I don't know. I said, wait a second. Maybe Rob's aliens know what happened. We can get Rob to channel and I'll ask the space <laughs> You know, and then it's you know, like, well, why don't we just do a show where we get together things that we were all interested in that we don't know answers to, and we'll put it together as a format. We'll get Rob to channel about it, and we'll interview Trevor Arda from whoever is applicable for the particular mystery, and we'll see if we can shine some light on these great mysteries of time, you know, and um, I think it'll be a really popular show. You know, the format we have laid out for it, I think, is going to be a winning formula. Oh, it's going to be amazing. I know that for sure. And and that's something, too, uh, once I get... I might even be able to show the trailer before we, we jump off tonight, too. But if not, I'll definitely play it uh, the next time we do a show. But uh, I want to give you guys a chance, too, to chat with William about some things. So if you want, click the link, jump in for a call. Or if you have a question in chat, you can type it down. We'll throw it up on the screen uh, and we'll ask that way uh, for that. So any questions you guys have, either jump in here or throw them down on the screen. Um, it's something that I, I'm excited to do, the, the project. But are there any other things that you're working on right now that, that, that you want to share with people to let them know what you've got going on? Well, right now I'm hyper-focused on my business because if I put in the time right now, um, I don't want to, like many people out there, I don't want to have to spend all my time tied to money-making activities. My ATM business is basically to fund my work with the ET Whisperer and all my other little pet projects because I have expensive tastes when it comes to, to these grandiose things. Producing films is not cheap. Um, but no, actually, I've been, so, I've been so tied up on that right now. In fact, that's one of the things... I've been self-reflecting on lately is that I need to start turning away work and, and getting back to doing some more things that I want to do. Uh, I love doing, well, the next thing that we're going to be doing, Rob, if there's anybody out there that's ever read Jonathan Livingston Siegel, I'm finally going to be putting that together with Rob. We're going to do an audio broadcast. I would highly recommend to anybody out there. If you haven't read the book, Jonathan Livingston Siegel by Richard Bach, pick up a copy. It's a fantastic little story. And I've been wanting to produce it as a radio drama where I would voice the narrator and then I would get other people like Rob to voice different parts of the book. So that's something we're going to be working on, Rob. So prepare yourself for that. Oh, yeah. Um, as for me, I'm always constantly studying metaphysics. Right now, I'm turned on to Neville Goddard. I found a lot of his, a lot of his lectures on YouTube, a lot of them, like hours and hours and hours of Neville Goddard lectures. So that's, he's my latest metaphysical guy that I'm listening to right now. Uh, I'll probably always be taking continuing education credits, which shall we say in metaphysical reality creation. I've um, listened to 15 minutes of that video you sent me too. Oh yeah. How'd you yeah. He's pretty good. Well, I don't, I don't know. I haven't been following the chat room. If there's anybody else out there that's been following Neville Goddard, um, not so far. No one's commented on that, but, uh, someone did read the Johnny, uh, 
the Jonathan Livingston Siegel book and said that that was amazing. Uh, and, and that was great. And if anyone's got questions too in the chat and you're a little shy about uh, popping your voice in here, please feel free to paste that down in here. Uh, we're going to take some questions from William before we jump off tonight. Um, so any questions you have for William, whether it's about things he's talked about tonight, whether it's a metaphysical idea that you're pondering, um, cause you know, William, this is one part of himself that he hasn't had the opportunity to showcase. Uh, but when it comes to metaphysics, he's got a very deep, profound, prolific understanding of metaphysics in a way that a lot of people don't. So I think uh, it's really great uh, for him to cover even questions about that, you know, things that have been going on with your experience that you have questions about. Feel free to drop that down. Uh, I'm going to paste the link again uh, for the call in for those of you who can't find it in the description. And that way we'll be able to uh, get some callers in here if you guys want. Um, but yeah, so the work thing being less is, is an important thing for you. As you know, I did that now for three years so that we can spend as much time with the baby for her growth, development, and her bond with us as possible. And this now is just getting back to the upramping of the channeling work that I do. And I find myself to have great experience of feeling positive, not just about what I do, but how it helps with other people's lives. And I know that that can be found in any work. And that was one thing that my dad used to, to really drill into me when we were younger is, you know, um, some people look at carpet installers because that's what he did. And that's what I did for my whole first chunk of my life, going around the country doing uh, a specific type of carpet that didn't require a cubicle office systems to be lifted or broke apart. Mm -hmm. uh, we could just take out the old carpet, put in the new. And he said some people look down on this art, but there's very few people who can go into a building, go into someone's home, or go into an office and completely relook or remake the entire look of that place in one day. And when I leave at night, I can look down at the floor and see the exact outcome of what I just put in. And all the time, even though 90% of the people in this office will never appreciate what the carpet looks like or don't care about it, they're, they're going to be comfortable. They're going to be at ease. They're going to feel better because they now have this beautiful padding under their feet to take their shoes off or just walk around on. Or it'll look pretty for those who actually can appreciate the aesthetics of it. So this was something that I took on with me to factories when I used to produce uh, steering wheel uh, columns and dashboard assemblies. Uh, for Ford uh, Expeditions, when they first came out, I, I saw the Expedition before it went public because I was in the factory making the dashboards. These types of things I brought in. What are you saying now when it comes to the pet projects, when it comes to your work uh, with the ATMs, or, or when it comes to broadcasting? What do you feel like is your thing that makes you feel better about doing what you do? Or what's that big payoff for you? when you're done producing uh, a YouTube event or going to a speech for anti-circumcision or uh, installing a new ATM? Well, the only thing I can really offer, the, again, this is, if you asked me this years ago, I don't know what I would have said, but now, and if you ask me 20 years from now, it'll probably be a different answer still. But I, the only thing I can really offer the world is my perspective. I know I'm kind of a, an out there, weird kind of guy. Um, I don't know, though. That part of that is living in the South. I tell people if I was living back in New York, nobody would even notice me. I would just be a regular guy up there. <laughs> a regular um, weirdo, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, would even, you know, like when I was up visiting you in Kalamazoo, I feel like that would be a place that I could kind of blend in because it's more metropolitan. But I'm living in uh, small town Virginia. So, you know, I stick out like a sore thumb around here. Uh, I like to give people my perspective. I like to... I don't want to say I'm a self-help guy, you know, because that kind of that doesn't really describe me at all. But I do like to let people know that you really can do whatever you want. Um, I, it seems like so impossible sometimes. I think a lot of people that are attracted to channeling and metaphysics and for again, for lack of a better term, what you do is kind of in the vein of self-help, Rob. 
Um, cause I know that's what Trev and Artif do is like, yeah, they, they're very great guidance counselors, but they always try and lead people to help themselves. And I guess not that I'm somebody that should be looked up to or venerated, but you know, seven years ago, I was an alcoholic working a miserable job that I didn't like with no electricity sitting in jail, um, you know, for my latest DUI. And now I run this massive ATM empire. I'm doing broadcast media. I'm working on movies and everything. And you can really do whatever you put your mind to. I know time and time again, if you, whether you're listening to Trevin Ardiff or Bashar or uh, Abraham Hicks or Seth or anything, this theme keeps repeating. Yeah. You can create your own reality. You can do it. You hear it so many times it loses its meaning sometimes. But I promise you, once it clicks in your mind that you really can do whatever you want to do, and particularly because we're living in America, I know somebody, some people out there are not necessarily living in America, and this isn't to disparage other countries. I've traveled around, and there's many places in the world that I love, but uh, I am an American first and foremost, and that's just what I'm doing in this lifetime. And if you if you happen to be in this country, you forget that just by just by living here. Just by being born in America, you were born into affluence with running water, uh, electricity. And that's something that when I moved down here to the South, there's still people to this day in this county that don't have an indoor bathroom. It's unbelievable to me, but it's true. Out here in some of the northern parts of the county or out if you start heading into West Virginia. Yeah, I was going to say where I was born is the same thing. In West Virginia, a lot of people in the mountains don't have uh, running water uh, through an electric pump. They pump it by hand and they use owl house. Right. But, you know, to, the overarching point is that you really can do whatever you want. You really, really can. I know that some of you out there might be clocking in at these miserable jobs. Uh, I give people the same advice that I give anybody else. Find out what you like to do. And then make time for it. If you start telling yourself all the time, well, I don't have time for this. I'm doing everything else. You're telling yourself a story and you're putting yourself further and further from what you want to do. Usually when people say they don't have time to do something, it's because they're afraid of failing at it. It's my experience, although that may not always be the case. But if there's something you like to do, say you're stuck in a job that you don't like or a situation you don't like, a relationship you don't like. Find something you do like to do. Work at it a little bit, even if you can only do it for a few minutes a day. But if you keep working at it, it will expand and fill up more and more of your life, which by necessity will take whatever you don't like about your life, and it'll, that'll start taking up less and less of your life until it's not even there. Your job will just fall away. You know, like now, uh, it was like that with ATMs. I wasn't, I wasn't doing well when I first started, but I kept placing them, kept placing them. Before you know it, my God, this is the most money I ever made in my life. And it just happens one day. And it, and it did so because you continued to do what it was that you were excited to do. And basically, from from me getting to know you, and I, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but from my perspective, I've always looked at it like one of your greatest excitements was not to be in, in, encased into a system that took away your ability to choose, whether that's ATMs, whether it's selling uh, soap in a box, razor blades, whatever it is. You didn't want to have to be in a process where others controlled your time, your energy, your efforts, or your finances. Right. That's exactly true. And I've crafted my life like that. And it's not everybody's like that. Some people enjoy the camaraderie of being parts of things. And I can't function that way. You know, it's all very individualized. That's why I don't want to speak like, like I'm some kind of professor or guru, you know, because only you really know what you want to do with yourself and your time. Uh, for me, it was cutting adrift from society as best I could and, and leading my own life as a total individualist. Absolutely. And I think that's an admirable thing, e even if you do enjoy the social interactions. You know, I, I also know people who love going to that nine to five, not having to worry about executive function, um, management of time, management of finances or uh, or inventory or any of that. They just go, go to their job, do what they do, get the check and come home and they love it. And that's great mm -hmm. if that's what excites you. And I think that's the beautiful way to put it too. What's going to work for one doesn't work for all, which ties back into a lot of things we talked about with with politics, with living your life, with expressing your, your excitements in the way that you want and just being you at, at the greatest pace. 
I, I want to give everybody one more chance. Uh, I know that our show has just started back up. This is only the second week. So, you know, not as many people uh, came in as they were back in this. But I want to give you guys last chance to call in or to leave a question in the chat. If not, we'll wrap it up uh, fairly soon and call it a night. But I'd really like for anyone who's excited to call in or to put in a message to go ahead and drop it now. Uh, or forever hold your peace. I think that's what they say. In the right. Things, right? Um, so that's available. And I, I think it's admirable. And, you know, you knew coming in just by speaking about the conservative political thing that that, that can turn a lot of people off. But I can tell you, me and William have talked about politics many times. We've talked about life. We've talked about everything. And wherever there was anything to know about William, you can always tell by his fire inside of him and his desire to do better for himself, for his family, for, for the collective, for, for whatever or whoever he was being exchanged with in that time, or himself in general. And, and that's always led him to a really positive uh, outcome. Even when things went bad, he took that and looked at it. And I think that's unique because a lot of people, like I said, just can't do that you know they can't master that part of taking the big feelings of of loss or, or feelings of catastrophe and saying you know what something good's got to come from this if not why would it be here you know uh, so that in itself is is definitely uh, uh an opportunity to do that so thank you guys too for for those of you who are commenting in uh we appreciate all the comments we got a donation earlier on in the show too um, and I'm going to put that up on the screen as, as a thanks for, for you doing that. Um, and, and I, I'm not even going to try to say the whole name, uh, Zenib Whitaker Kleinbrink. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry for butchering the name for the donation. We appreciate you guys giving feedback, uh, and, and just showing up. This is going to be every two weeks, guys. Um, with that, is there anything else uh, last to say, brother? Anything that you haven't said that you feel like you should say? Oh, there's plenty of stuff I haven't said. <laughs> Me and William, that's the thing about us. Sometimes our Patreon people are like, can you guys just shut up and get to the channel? You guys have been talking two hours now. We can go on all night, I guarantee you. <laughs> I know. I'm always a handy guest. If you need to burn through an hour and a half, we could do it with no problem. <laughs> no problem at all. And this, <laughs> this is one of the least uh, difficult interviews i'm sure i'll ever do uh very few people I, I know i've got a couple of my friends who i've been bugging about coming on the show and we'll see if they show up but when you're with friends it's very easy to do and navigate because you're familiar with one another um all right we we don't oh go ahead brother you're gonna say something i was actually i was just gonna say one of the other things i meant to talk about tonight and I don't know how to even fit it in a segue into it is that we were, when you and I first started doing this, we were talking about how in this type of community, um, there are people obsessed with positivity and love and light and all that and everything. And I have found that some of the best things that come in my life come out of a laughter, a lot of despair, you know, and I think that there's a, uh, one of the things I see right now in sort of the metaphysical community is this obsession with happiness, you know, cause life is life and people are like well if i'm going to re achieve enlightenment they think they're going to exist in some state of bliss all day or or meditative contemplation and it's not like that at all you know i remember when i was um before i had achieved the level of success i had now i'd listen to these metaphysical people and they'd be like, oh, yeah, you can do anything. You just put your mind to it. I'm like, well, that's easy for you. You're running this international corporation and you got millions of dollars and everything. And I don't know how to really quite hit home the point that as long as you are doing you, basically living your own individual tastes and preferences out and trying your best to be you, everything will fall into place if you could only just get out of the way of yourself and stop worrying about it. Sorry, I, I tried to unmute and couldn't. Uh, I, I think that's a beautiful thing. Uh, like my dear friend uh, Sander Phoenix said, suffering will free you. And there is uh, some truth to that, but also truth to how you take the suffering and, and what you learn from it. Because suffering without that lesson or understanding is just suffering. Uh, it's just uh, more to throw on to yourself to, to go through life when the experience. Um, 
so I appreciate it, brother. Thank you for coming in. Uh, all all of all of those who are at our Patreon, we'll see you again uh, shortly. Uh, two days. Yeah. yeah, three days from now. Yeah, three days from now. So on well, the not, no, I have to say, though, Seth had – this reminded me of a Seth quote. He said, suffering's not really valuable unless it teaches you how not to suffer. That's very profound, too. Seth is amazing. I love the Seth material uh, in general. That was one of the other common bonds, too. Uh, once William had found my channeling and, and talked about uh, the experience of that, it's definitely – uh, something that we bonded over. Actually, we did a live stream from the Seth house. For those of you who remember uh, a few months back, he went to the house that Seth did most of the books in with Jane Roberts and uh, did Rob, a broadcast. Rob, yeah. I, I just got a notification from my memories today that that was one year ago. So I don't know what you're talking about a few months back. Holy, that was one year ago today? Yep. One year ago today, I was busy painting the Seth house with Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> we would have... those ladies are wonderful by the way for anybody that's listening the if you're interested i have to plug uh kate and oshara are the two ladies that are uh spearheading the point the um, to restore the seth house this is where jane roberts did all of the vast majority of her channeling when she created most of the seth books it was at this house in elmira new york so as a non-profit it is a nonprofit. If anybody out there is uh, particularly interested in the Seth material, hang on, I think I can find their website now. I believe it's the SethHouse.com. I think so too, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll get a link in the description also uh, if if William can't find it now. They are amazing. I met Oshara back in 2014 when we did our first channel panel on LA. She's an amazing lady. The SethHouse.org. Yeah. Yes. The Seth organization, House. yeah, that's something too. Uh, we're going to try to set up a fundraising channeling event to get multiple channelers to to sh to give their time and do a paid event, and all of the money will end up going to the Seth House for the restoration. They're they're um, uh, what 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 would you call it? They're they're turning it into a Seth a monument, basically. Yeah, a museum. museum. Right. Yeah. And it's amazing. The energy there is absolutely amazing. And uh, maybe you should mention this to Daryl when you get a chance to speak with him. Uh, I heard he, you say that he's going to be your guest next month. Uh, yeah, he'll be my guest uh, coming up on the 25th of next month. So not the next show, but the show after uh, Daryl will be my guest. Absolutely. That's exciting. Uh, I, I absolutely love listening to that man as well. Well, you can call in and talk to him. I think I will, actually. <laughs> yeah, I then we'll, I we'll get a call going. I think I will. It's a shame nobody wanted to call to talk with me tonight. I feel so dejected now. And <laughs> no, I don't don't feel bad. I had to beg for the calls last time. It's 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 funny. When we were doing the network before, we were getting uh, several hundred thousand views per month, but we also had seven channels, uh, seven shows running, one per day, every day, all week. We're going to be getting back to that. But for now, it's just little old me and you. Right now, it's me and you. And uh, and. We'll get it back to running, and, and Kalina's going to be starting her show after she gets her second video up and stuff. Uh, but that segues into the perfect time. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about the schedule coming up. William will be with me at the Patreon uh, the 30th. It's going to be the Q&A. Uh, people send in their questions. They get thrown into a hat, and whoever gets drawn gets answered. That's going to be on the 30th in the evening at 9.30 to 10 start time. But earlier that day, we also have the ET Whisper group channeling class where you can come in, learn techniques, the same techniques I've used to channel, the same techniques I've taught to people. But instead of doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, channeling classes, we're doing them in groups. There's already a lot of people that signed up. So if you're interested in that, go to etwhisper.com and check that out. Uh, on the front page, you can navigate to events. Or services, sorry, it's now on services. It was on events, but we had to move it. Uh, now it's a built-in part of our website. So you can go to the uh, book sessions online and join the group. We also have all the stuff that we normally have, the uh, channeling sessions and the group channeling sessions. We also are going to be doing the open forum very soon when I get the form made out for that for people to send in their questions. I will make a quick video explaining kind of the regulations uh, of doing questions. And it's not that you can't ask what you want for Trevin Ardiff. It's just 
the questions and questions, uh, you know, putting who you want it to, things like that. Just the way we set up the questions so that they're easy answered. And we're going to be doing uh, our monthly galactic channelings coming very, very soon, guys. So we're getting everything ready for the ET Whisper to get set up. Uh, and I wanted to announce all of that to you guys, too. Something to look forward to. Something exciting. Um, I want to express my own excitement, my love for all of you guys who have joined us. Thank you for being here, whether you're watching it later or those of you who joined us live. Really, really appreciate it. And I want to thank you, too, brother. You're an amazing human being. Uh, one of my greatest friends. I love you very much. And I appreciate you taking your time out on a very busy day to come and chat with us and kind of share your story and journey with us. It's an invaluable uh, experience for me and I'm sure many others. Uh, we've already seen in the comments tons of people saying they heard exactly what they needed to tonight and thanking you for being here. Well, I'm glad. Suzanne wants to know when we will see the Anira knot. So that's really on you, Rob, whenever yeah. we can record that first episode. We're, we're, we're in the process of trying to get the first episode uh, up and ready. We're having a, a slight rehaul on our office area for the network and for easy recording. And it's almost done. And once that gets done, uh, we're going to shoot that. So it'll probably, hopefully, I'll be able to shoot that in the next couple of weeks. I don't. Uh, I don't want to make any promises, but I have a strong feeling that the people on Patreon will get to see it before anyone else does, is my guess. Yeah, well, I'm sure they'll be able to check that out soon. Our uh, Patreon people are a bit spoiled, but um, we definitely want that to be done as soon as possible, but it will take time to produce, and we're only going to uh, to make a couple episodes to see uh, how we can present it the best. Um, William and Ian are are two of the brightest minds uh in that part of it with the marketing and ian is amazing director editor his work i've seen he he's even done special effects that were hollywood level for like uh movies about et's and stuff so it's really going to be an amazing project and it's going to be something done well above and beyond anything me and kalina have been able to produce on our own um, just because we'll have the expert there that's helping us out with that. So it'll come soon, guys. Um, yeah, Uruguay. Holy moly, thank you for coming all the way from Uruguay. Thank you, uh, Fran. We appreciate seeing you. That's actually Uruguay. Uruguay, sorry. Yeah, I did the American thing for yeah. you. <laughs> Uruguay. Stupid uh, American. I know, we do everything backwards. Uruguay. My, my friend always harasses me and says, yeah, you're the country that doesn't use the metric system. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, we got to be different from everybody. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you, brother, for being here. I appreciate your time, your love. This has been a great, great show. Love you guys so, so much. Um, we appreciate all of your love. We'll be back in two weeks, and we're going to run the show every two weeks until it goes to every week, probably when the network gets a little closer to being on the ground. But until then, you'll see me on uh, – let me check. You'll see me on the uh, 11th, and on the 25th, we will be having Daryl Anka, the channeler of Bashar, here with us to talk and to share some of his own experiences and get some call in. So love you guys very much. I hope you guys have a beautiful night. Thank you again, brother. Um, if anyone wants to check out any of the projects you're doing, anything like that, um, do you have a place set up for that to happen now or, or to be continued? Well, the only place that I can guarantee won't be taken down by the authorities is fincastleunderground.com. Uh, you can certainly get in touch with me there. There's not really much happening, but that's definitely a way to reach out to me. I've got Fincastle Underground 2 is my YouTube channel, but right now it's mostly, mostly just ET Whisperer stuff because, you know, it, it's just a matter of time before they yank that off again. I'm, being that I'm a subversive and an enemy of the state. It, <laughs> well, that's one way to say it, right? But no, I, um, I, I will have uh, – the big thing I'm working on now is going to be the Mad Gasher. That's the next big thing I'm rolling out, uh, independent of the work I'm doing with you. So they can always find me on Patreon, uh, your Patreon. You can support the ET Whisperer at patreon.com and listen to me host the show twice a month. <laughs> yeah, that's one place you can find it too. Fincastleunderground.com. Uh, for those of you who want to join our Patreon, come over and check it out. The rest of you, I will see you guys soon with another video we'll be releasing hopefully in the next week or so. 
and then when we get the galactic channelings and the open forums running, you will see me on camera. You will hear me uh, talking to you guys directly and having a live broadcast then. I love you guys all so, so much with all of my heart. Thank you again, brother. Thank you guys for being here. I love you all, and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you for Good having night, me. Guys. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone.